Let's welcome TBA to the stage. Warm hand, please. Thanks. undergraduate. It was 19, at University of Toronto. It was 1994. A fellow student in one of my classes at Sid Smith said, what are you doing next week? Do you want to come to a training at the Wellesley Hospital for the HIV and AIDS floor? So I said, sure, I like trying new things. And as a volunteer, we did many things. Sometimes we ran to the corner shop, we bought a newspaper for somebody, and other times we helped people who had an IV and support them to go out to the smoking area so they could have a cigarette. So I was doing just that on a very cold, blizzardy February evening. And there was a 19-year-old young man, same age as myself. So we were outside in the smoking area. And he turned to me and he said, do you know what I do in the middle of the night? I was like, what do you do? <laughs> he said, I unhook my IV, I throw on my tracksuit, I run across the street to coffee time. I buy a coffee and I read a newspaper and I just pretend that I'm normal. And I looked at him and I thought, we're both 19, we both live in Toronto, but there's a world of stigma that separates us. And that world is very real today. So when people ask me, why do you do HIV research? Why do you focus on stigma? I tell them about this young man and I say, why should anybody have to pretend to be normal? So what connects the stories between this young man and a lesbian in Swaziland, an internally, dis an internally displaced woman in Haiti living in a tent city, a transgender woman in Jamaica, and an indigenous woman in the Northwest Territories in Canada? While these people may seem like they live worlds apart, they are connected by underlying threads of social inequity that increase the risk for acquiring HIV. There are 30 million people in the world today living with HIV. We have come a long way in developing effective antiretroviral medication so people can live healthy and long lives. We have not done so well in, in, in a impacting stigma and discrimination associated with HIV, with race, with gender, with sexual orientation. It's almost hard to believe that we are better at developing complex medications than at promoting human rights. And this really does matter because stigma impacts health. When you're looking at the case of HIV, stigma makes people not want to go get an HIV test. Or if they get a test, makes them not want to go and get the results. If the test test positive, they don't want to tell their family and friends because they're afraid of being rejected. And sometimes people hide their medications or don't even want to take their medications because they're afraid of what will happen if people find out that they're HIV positive. For a long time in HIV research, the focus has been on the individual. What did that person do that put them at risk for getting HIV? And I travel a lot everywhere in the world. This is the most common question I get. Why don't people just use condoms? It's a good question. I tell them it's a very good question. They genuinely want to know the answer. But it's not so simple. Who controls who uses a condom? Where do youth learn how to use condoms and talk about safer sex with their partners? Maybe if we learned that in school, there would be increasing rates of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections among youth in Canada. Sex and relationships are social. And so this is where we need to focus. So I want to bring you to Swaziland. Swaziland is a small mountain kingdom located within South Africa. South Africa and Swaziland have the highest HIV infection rates in the world. I have been working there for the last two years with local lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, or LGBT groups. There are specific ways that women are expected to act everywhere in the world, including in Swaziland and South Africa. These ways include getting married to a man, having children, and dressing in what's considered feminine clothing. What happens when women don't follow those gender norms? What happens is violence much of the time. And for lesbian and bisexual women, that violence is often sexual violence. It's called corrective rape. Sometimes women are raped in order 
for people to think that they're going to change their sexual orientation, which actually doesn't happen, but race is a form of power and control. This is really about controlling expressions of differences in sexuality and gender expression. And so the work that I've been doing and the work of other people in South Africa and other places shows that sexual orientation is, and being lesbian or bisexual is a risk factor for sexual violence that increases HIV vulnerability. So just by being a woman doesn't fit into social norms and put you at risk for HIV infection. Next, I want to bring you to a very beautiful country, Haiti. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and has the highest HIV infe infection rates in the region. The January 12, 2010 earthquake led to the collapse of Haiti's social, economic, and health infrastructure. I worked in Haiti from 2011 to 2012. We trained women who were internally displaced, living in tent cities. This is an example of one right across the street from where I was working. And we trained them to be community health workers, to educate other women about many things around sexual health, mental health. So out of the 200 women we worked with, 90% were unemployed. People didn't just lose their homes in the earthquake. They lost the places where they were working, they lost schools, they lost healthcare systems. The women we were working with, average salary was $4 a month, not a day, a month. Two thirds of these women didn't have food to eat every day. So what happens in, in situations like this? Young women often exchange sex for food and money to support themselves and their family. How much power do you think a young woman exchanging sex for food who lives in a tent has to negotiate condom use? And remember, this is highest HIV infection rates in the Western Hemisphere. Once again, you have a young woman, just because of the social world she lives in, is at increased risk for HIV infection. I'm going to bring you somewhere else in the Caribbean. I'm going to bring you to Jamaica. I have been working in Jamaica for the last two years with Jamaica AIDS Support for Life. We've been working with LGBT youth, and the situation of LGBT youth is not that easy in Jamaica. Homosexuality is criminalized, and there's a lot of stigma. This time last year, I was leaving Kingston and doing a focus group with young transgender women. All of these women were living outside under a bridge in a place called the Bully. Why were they living outside? They had been kicked out from their families and communities because of stigma associated with their gender identity. Nobody would rent them a place to live or hire them because of stigma. So what did they do? They, many of them had to turn to survival sex work. So you have people who have precarious housing doing survival sex work at increased risk for sexual and physical violence. Remember how I said sexual violence is a risk factor for HIV infection? Here you have another group of young women at elevated risk just because they don't fit into social norms. Finally, I'm bringing you back to Canada. Um, I'm bringing you back to the Northwest Territories, where I just was last weekend. Um, you might not know this, but the Northwest Territories has sexually transmitted infection rates, or STI rates, 10 times higher than the rest of the country. They also have youth suicide rates double the national average. And these sexual and mental health disparities are even more pronounced for Indigenous people in the North and in Canada. Indigenous peoples have HIV infection rates three and a half times higher than non-Indigenous people, and that's directly related to the ongoing history of colonization, inter intergenerational trauma from residential schools, and poverty rates three times higher than non-Indigenous people. But I didn't come here just to talk about the problems. I have seen too much passion and joy and solidarity to be hopeless. The solutions are in the social fabric of every place that I have ever been to. And these solutions extend beyond the individual. They build communities. They create social change and challenge stigma and discrimination. I wish I could tell you about all the people who've inspired me and the work that I do, but I just have time to introduce you to four. So I would like you to meet Malume from Swaziland. Malume started an LGBT support group in his living room. And this group has grown to be a national organization called the Rock of Hope. They do trainings for healthcare workers and social workers. They support parents of LGBT people. They provide safer sex and HIV prevention, information, and education. But perhaps most importantly, what they do is they create a community and social support for LGBT people in Swaziland but they can just be who they are, and they don't have to pretend to be normal. 
Next, I just want to introduce you to somebody, we'll call her Marie, in Leogan. Marie was trained as one of the community health workers. When I met her, she was living in a single tent with four siblings and her mother, her father had died. She saved up all the money she made as a community health worker, and after six months, built a small house for her family, she helped her sisters go to school, and she bought beauty supplies so she could be a hairdresser. So she actually promoted housing security, and financial security, and more education that reduced the risk of HIV infection, not only for herself, but for her family. Next, I want you to meet an amazing woman called Candace Liss, who is also a PhD candidate at the Dallas School of Public Health right here at the University of Toronto. Candace is from the Northwest Territories, a small community called Fort Smith, and a large <coughs> HIV family. Remember how I said there were the highest STI rates in Canada and the Northwest Territories? Well, she decided to change that as part of her PhD program. She started a program called FOXI, Fostering Open Expression Among Youth. They use indigenous methods such as drumming and eating, working with elders, bringing people back to the land, and the arts, so visual arts, theater arts, to teach young women about sexuality, safer sex. And I was really honored to be part of the Foxy team that won the $1 million Arctic Inspiration Prize in December 2014, when we were recognized in the House of Commons. Now that's pretty inspiring. Finally, I want you to meet, from Toronto, Jessica Whitbread of the International Community of Women Living with HIV. She started this Valentine's campaign you can all take part in next Valentine's Day. You can create a Valentine's, a gift, a photo with a supportive message for women living with HIV right here in Toronto or anywhere in the world. Here is a quilt made by positive women in Jamaica in Russian for positive women in Russia. Now that's in solidarity. So the theme of today's event is a constellation of insights. It's about connecting the dots. It's about connecting ideas. It's about connecting people. And it's about connecting change. I see the connections between stigma and HIV risk, and I see the connections between people making creative community-based change in places that might seem far away from each other, like Swaziland and the Northwest Territories, in communities that might seem different, like LGBT communities, and internally displaced women. HIV infection risk, risks are shaped in the social world, and so are the solutions. So I think back to that young man I introduced you to at the beginning of the talk. I wonder where is he now? Is he happy? Is he healthy? Does he feel normal? Does he have a community? And I think we can do better than this. I think that we can change this narrative. And I think that it can start right here. We can all challenge stigma, stigma associated with HIV. We can challenge racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia. We can challenge it within ourselves. We can challenge it within our friend circles, within our families, within our communities, within our classrooms. We can all be part of social change that challenges social inequities. So it can start with us, and it can start right here. Thank you.